Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name. Thank you for your children. Thank you for your servants. Thank you for brothers and sisters, ministers of the gospel. Thank you for leaders in this church. Lord, we ask you, as your people are serving you, I pray, Lord, heavens, the heavens will open up for them. And great will be the manifestation of your power in every life in Jesus' name. I pray that tonight you open our eyes of understanding that this single life we have will be useful, will be profitable. And we pray, Lord, that you will make use of us to be a blessing to millions of people, even in our generation in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can be seated. We're looking at something very important in the word of God tonight. And I'm reading to you from 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 7. It says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Here you'll find here Paul, the apostle, saying, I have. He said, I have done this. I have gone this way. I have achieved. I want to talk to you tonight about a single life. A single life. All you have is a single life. And we're talking about maximizing the value of a single life. Maximizing the value of a single life. I read the story of a young boy. He had one piece of coin with him. And he went to the groceries. That is where you buy things with the mother. And then he said, the mother said, very quickly, choose what you want to buy so that we can move on. And then the child looked at this, dropped it, looked at this and dropped it, looked at another one and dropped it. And then the mother said, hurry up and just buy something. Then he turned to mommy and said, mother, I have only one coin. And I have to be very selective and juicy on what I buy with that coin. What a parable. What a story. What an instruction. What an illustration for you and for me that we have just one life. What you spend that life on. How you spend that life and what you invest that life on is very important. That's why I want to talk to you that you look at your life tonight, just only one life. Just one single life. And you want to invest in something that really matters. Maximizing the value of a single life. Uh, let me read to you from Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 3. Revelation chapter 15, I was looking at verse 3. It says, And they sang, and they sing, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Just stop there for a moment. Here we find the people who have got to heaven. And they were going to sing the song of victory, and the song of joy. Isn't it essential? Number one, they sang the song of the Lamb. That's not surprising. Christ died for us on the cross of Calvary. Christ gave everything that he had and sought for the inhabitants of heaven, singing the song of the Lamb. That will be wonderful. And that's what we're looking up to. But you know, what's very important here, look at this in verse 3. It says, and they sing the song of Moses. That the inhabitants of heaven, that the people in heaven, they will sing the song of Moses, glorifying the Lord for the life that Moses lived. That man maximized his single life. And that's what we are calling upon you to consider, that you have just one life, and you want to maximize the worth and the value of that life. Let me come to Luke chapter 16. And we're reading here from verse 22. Luke chapter 16, and we're reading from verse 22. And I'm reading here just the first part. Luke 16. Look at verse 22. 
And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into, tell me, Abraham's Lord. You understand what that means? This is paradise. This is heaven. And they call heaven, they call paradise Abraham's bosom. It's like if you were going to give another name to Lagos and then you speak a man, you're thinking of what man are we going to pick? Are we going to choose? Instead of saying Lagos, we say so and so. Then it will show you how important that person is. God wants another name, an alternative for paradise, an alternative for heaven. And it says, call this place Abraham's bosom and so all the people that were dying as they were going and they went to heaven and they went to paradise they went to abraham's bosom the man became so important the friend of god a faithful man a loyal man a consecrated man he invested the single life he had and that single life became so important that it's referred to even in heaven and heaven or paradise is referred to as abraham's bosom you can think about a number of people in the old testament and new testament that made their life so significant that they maximized the single life that they had abraham moses joshua david Daniel, a host of other people. You come to the New Testament, John, John the Beloved, and John the Baptist. And John, John made him single himself out. In fact, that man, there's a lot we can say about him. And then there's Peter. And then there is Paul. These people mark themselves out as significant. I pray that your life will be significant. Can you think of other people that minimized the value of their single life here on earth? Look at Lot there. See what became of him. Look at his family. And look at Achan there. See what became of him. That man minimized his life. And then you come to look at something. You come to look at Solomon. And then you come to the New Testament. You're thinking of Judas Iscariot. And you're thinking of uh, Demas. Demas has forsaken me. He has lodged this present world. The people that minimized their lives. I just want to remind you. Only one life. It will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Things of this life soon shall all pass away. But there is coming a judgment day. Lots of others may in this life walk or toil for riches or gain. But I will rather labor for this dear name, only one life, and it will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. What do you want to do with your life? What's your life going to amount to? Is your life going to shrink and become so little? I see if it doesn't matter or is, is there going to be an expansion in your life that this single life you have you maximize it and then you can say at the end of your life I have run the race I have finished my course and I've kept the faith I pray it will happen to you in Jesus name we're going to consider three things number one we're considering the commission and conviction of a responsible life. A responsible life. You have a life. And then you are responsible for how you spend that life. And there's a commission that comes to you. And then there is a conviction. Because of that commission, you have a conviction. And your life is a responsible life. Number two, the concentration and the this one is long commercialization of a regrettable life the concentration there are some people they look at a small thing they look at a little object they look at something inconsequential and they consecrate and concentrate all their efforts all their strength all their power 
all their intelligence, all their time, they concentrate on that little thing and they commercialize the precious life the Lord has given them. And when they come to the end of life, they regret. And I know there are people who might have been here tonight and they're not here. Why? Commerce, money, trading, extracurricular activities, more education, evening classes. They commercialize this life. All they're thinking about, how much more can I earn? How much more can I get? And at the end of life, when money will not matter, and when the things of the world will not matter, they'll put their finger in their mouth and say, I regret. Had I known, I would have spent my life in a better way. Thank God you are here tonight. Amen. Keep it up. The blessings of God will rest upon your life. Amen. Because every little thing we do for the Lord, he notices it. And he looks at it and he wants to bless us. He's looking for somebody he will splash greater blessings on and you're a candidate for greater blessings. Yeah. If you will not concentrate your life on something small, something inconsequential, something of no value, and you don't commercialize your life, and the devil puts a price on your life, and he says, how much do you want? Sell your soul to me. Sell your life to me. And say, this one has no price. It's so great. And it's so dear. And it's so costly. It took the blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. To die for me. This life is precious. The concentration. And the commercialization. Of a regrettable life. Number three. The consecration. And compensation of a rewardable life. The consecration and the compensation of a rewardable life. We're coming back to number one. Tell me number one on your notes there. The commission and the conviction of a responsible life. I want to show you something. Look at first Samuel. For Samuel chapter 17. For Samuel chapter 17. I'm reading to you here from verse 34. For Samuel chapter 17. I was reading from verse 34. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear. And took a lamb out of the flock. The man, this man, David, was a cattle rearer. What we we'll call them today, herdsman. In the Bible, they call them shepherds. And he took care of his father's sheep. That was his occupation. That was his day-to-day -day routine, what he did. But the work was so important to him, so essential to him. In fact, it was so important to him that when a lion came and took one of those uh, little, little lambs, he went after that lion and he smote that lion and killed the lion. It, it was so important to him, he could give his life for that. And then another time a bear came and took one of the lambs and the work he was doing was so essential, was so important to him that he went after that bear and killed that bear. But now there was another assignment, you know. When your work is very important, your work is very essential, it's your very life. Your work is so important to you, you could give your life for it. Because that's what happened to David over here, that he could give his life for that work. But then the children of Israel were on the battlefield. The army of the Lord was, on the battle, was in the battlefield and uh, the father sent him over there. There are some people that will say, Dad, I cannot take time out. Because the lives of those animals will be in danger. In fact, that you know what happened? A lion came, that's what I did. A bear came, and this is what I did. There are people that count their secular work so important 
they cannot take any time out for any other thing. Morning they are there, evening they are there, all the time they are there. And uh, those who sell in the market, those who are businessmen, and those who are, you know, they are teachers, they teach the regular school, and then they teach in the evening, they are all the time they are there. And, and if we say, now there is a meeting for us to come, they say, you know, Pastor, I love God and I love the work of God, but the work I am doing is so essential, I cannot take an hour off. I cannot take a day off. David could have said that. Because the work was so important for him that he could sacrifice his life. But I read that to you to read this other one in the Psalms. We're looking at Psalm 78. Psalm 78. And you'll see here what happened to David. The people who are so glued to their work. They're so glued to their day-to-day -day activity. And they're so glued to uh, whatever profession they have chosen. Like David had that profession. But look at this, Psalm 78. And I'm reading here from verse 70. Psalm 78. And we're reading from verse 70. 78 verse 70 look at what it says he chose david also his servant and took him from the sheepfold he took him from the sheepfold what if david said god i gave my life for this i endangered my life for this this work, the sheepfold, is so important to me that I even wanted to give up my life because of it. Now you are calling me to come and serve in the nation in this capacity. Lord, I cannot. All the Psalms you are reading that encourages you, inspires you, that inspire you, you will not be able to read them. You will not be available to write them. That he became the king in the land you, you would not have been able to hear of that. That we have Jesus Christ, the son of David, who is going to be the king of kings and the lord of lords. All that you will not hear. And that his name comes to the New Testament, to the New Covenant. And God said, I'm still going to send David back to you and he'll be your king, a united nation. All that you'll not find. But because he was able to give up that thing that was dear to him. What's so dear to you? That you could give your life for. Like David could give his life for the sheep. What's so dear to you? Can you give up that thing? Can you say, Lord, because of the call you're giving me. And because of this single life I want to maximize. Lord, I'm willing to give up anything and everything. Look at verse 71 there. In verse 71, still reading from that. Um, Psalm 78 verse 71 From following the we the, the ewe lambs The ewe great with young He brought him To feed Jacob His people And Israel his inheritance So he fed them According To the integrity of his heart And guided them By the skillfulness Of his hands I don't know whether you have had this experience of uh, been doing a particular work in the secular world for such a long time that that work has become part of your life and it's dear to you. You take that job like a baby. Now you are born again. Now you are a child of God. And the people, and you do the work in such a better way now that the people, even your director, your boss, or whoever, he's saying, We cannot find another person to replace this man here, to replace this woman here. I think that's what that could say about David. I cannot find any other child. I cannot find any other worker. I cannot find any other committed, consecrated person to take care of the sheep for me and for the family. Only David, he occupied a special position and yet God called him out of that. And he gave him something to do very different from what he had been doing and he accepted that. Can you accept that? Can you give up something so essential to you, so indispensable to you, so much part of your life? That's what make us to, makes us to read about David today. We'll read about you tomorrow. We'll hear about you in eternity. 
that you were able to give up that sin and you maximized a life the single life you have and you're going to do great things for the lord in jesus name i'm reading here from acts of the apostles chapter 13 acts of the apostles chapter 13 and i'm reading from verse 22 acts of the apostles chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 22 and when he had removed him he had removed Saul he raised up unto them David to be their king to whom also he gave testimony and said I have found David stop there for a moment it's like God was searching he looked at all the people living in this house he said no i can't find my man there he looked at people in this other street and examined them one by one i can't find my man there and then lo and behold he came to the family of jesse and Eliab was there Elab was there all the others were there he said no those cannot be and then he found David he said I found the man I found the man he consecrated man I found the man he committed man I found the man a man that will give his life for ordinary sheep I found the man a man I can trust a man that will do my will a man that will not deviate I found the man can God talk about you like that I found my man a man that will do everything I want him to do to the letter. Look at that verse 22. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill some of my will. All my will. I pray God will talk about me like that. A man that will not deviate. A man that will not be distracted. A man that will not compromise. A man that is totally yielded, completely yielded unto the Lord. I have found the man. There's a man here today. There's a woman here today. Where is the man? Where is the woman? God will find you. God will use you. This single life you have will be maximized in Jesus' name. We're talking about a commission. Because you see, God said, I found the man and I'm giving him a commission. And the commission, number one, became a personal conviction. A personal conviction. You know, when we talk about the great commission, the great commission, the great commission. But until you own it, until you accept it until you internalize it until you personify it until you say that commission is mine and becomes a personal conviction you know everybody's job is nobody's business everybody is to do it it belongs to all of us but you take it personal and you say this is mine I pray that the commission will become a personal conviction in your life in Jesus' name. Number two is a practical commitment. A practical commitment. You see, good intentions will not achieve anything. Good intentions will fail. And good intentions will fade until there is an immediate action. You take action on that thing. You say, this is the commission. I receive it. It is mine. Whatever others do, whatever others do not do, however other people act, other people might say, I'm waiting for Brother So and so to pick it up. Then I will pick it up. I'm waiting for the pastor to recognize me and to call my name. Then I will do it. I'm waiting for a group pastor to choose me and to appoint me. Then I will give myself to it. Other people might be giving excuses like that. But you are saying, I accept it. This commission is mine. I will fulfill it. I am the one to get this job done. It is not something that is given generally to everybody. It is mine. A personal conviction and then it is mine. A practical commitment that you commit yourself to. Is there a work in your community that you know must be done? And nobody is doing it. Among the youths, among the children, among the women, is there a need you have seen? And all the time you are saying, our church is not doing it. Are you not the church? Where's the church? If you don't rise up and do it, 
they didn't commit this to my hand who will commit it to your hand when jesus christ already painted the picture on your heart and you should make that thing a personal conviction and say this is a commission it belongs to the church i am part of the church i'm going to do it if i don't do it who else will do it if I don't say it, who else will say it? If I don't put my shoulders to the yoke, who else will do that? I am the one, I will do it. I said I am the one, I will do it. Say it aloud, I am the one, I will do it. You will do it in Jesus' name. A personal conviction. A practical commitment. A priceless contribution a priceless contribution you know what if we can put a price on your contribution you have not contributed enough if we can look at your contribution your contribution in fulfilling the great commission and we can say brother so and so has done this this is the monetary value of what he has done if your contribution can have a tag price on it you have not done enough it is when the contribution becomes priceless and we say we'll just be praying for this brother nobody can put a price on we cannot pay for this we, until we say this sister look at what she's done in the kingdom of god we cannot pay her for this heaven will pay her heaven will pay you because here on earth your contribution is priceless and if you are managing if you are giving something to god it's something you are putting a price on i give him this now god if that's not sufficient make the announcement again through our leaders i'll give a little more i'll give it and then you are calculating i've given this i've given this i wonder what brother so and so has given i wonder what sister so and so has given if they have given like i have given everything would have been completed you put a price on your contribution you're not willing to go all the way and stretch yourself out on the altar of god and say this is my life i will spend it for the kingdom of god it is then god will look at you and say that's my man and that's my daughter you will be in jesus name and that's the contribution that he wants of us he's telling us in luke chapter 19 luke chapter 19 and i'm reading from verse 10 luke chapter 19 verse 10 this is the commission and this is what requires conviction from you and from me in luke chapter 19 verse 10 it says for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost the son of man that's the lord jesus christ is come to seek and to save that which was lost and after that now he passed it on to us look at verse 13 and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them tell me what he said occupy till i come occupy till i come any vacation there occupy till i come any excuse there occupy till i come hey pastor we just got married this morning saturday and there's workers meeting tonight pastor can i be excused well i don't know i'm not the one that give you the commission the one who gave the commission said occupy till i come pastor we just got a new baby in the family and everybody is rejoicing and they are coming to visit us at home and if they didn't meet us at home then they'll say where have we gone because this is the period of rejoicing can i excuse myself from the workers meeting and from the evangelism and from the seeking for the souls that are perishing i'm not the one that gave you the commission he gave the commission and he said tell me out what he said occupy till i come pastor i just lost my job this friday and they told me they were retrenching people and now i don't have anything to even rely on in fact i'm so sorrowful now well can i still go for the workers meeting can i do something for god or can i at this time nurse my wounds and leak my wounds and stay at home this time i don't know about that what i know is what he said what did he say occupy till i come 
it is while you are occupied like that and you don't care for whatever has happened a new job will meet you on the way and the new provision will come to your way in Jesus name if you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these other things and addition is coming this year will be added to your life in Jesus name can I have an amen over there up there you'll get it in Jesus name and so remember he's giving us the commission and there must be a personalization of that commission it becomes a personal conviction and there must be a practical something measurable something we see the commitment that you have and then there must be a contribution from your side that is incalculable priceless a priceless commitment we're coming to point number two the concentration and commercialization of a regrettable life there are many people who say they're christians they're going to regret at the end of life because money has become the center of their lives salvation they claim to be saved sanctification they claim they're sanctified baptism with the holy ghost they, came, they claim to be baptized in the holy ghost the question i'm asking them is why were you baptized in the holy ghost for trade for business for market for higher education for having the things of this life well jesus didn't say that you know what jesus said the reason why he gave us that baptism that power in the holy ghost you shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and ye shall be tell me witnesses that the purpose so if you have converted the use and the profit of the holy ghost in your life you know praise the lord since i have the holy ghost the holy ghost is attracting buyers to my shop it's attracting people they just come like this that's how you are using the holy ghost the holy ghost is not using you you are going to regret on the final day but you shall receive power after that ye have after the holy ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in judea and in samaria and then it says to the uttermost part of the earth don't commercialize your life and don't put a price on your life i can make more money i can do this i can do this i can do that that's commercialization of that single life it will be a regrettable life i pray you'll not regret in jesus name and look at luke chapter 12 luke chapter 12 and i'm reading from verse 16 luke chapter 12 and we're looking at it from verse 16 it says and he speak a parable unto them saying the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully and he thought within himself saying what shall i do because i have no room where where to lay or where to store where to bestow my fruits and he said this will i do have you seen how many times you say the word i i god is not in his equation God is not in his thought. Eternity does not weigh on him. And the reward is going to have after this life. That does not come into consideration. Only I, I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. And there are many people like that who say they are Christians. I pray you will not be among that number. I'm waiting for an amen there. In verse 18 it says and said, this will I do. I will pull down my pants and I will build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I, he continues, I, 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 I. That's a self-life. The life is built on self. My money, my house, my car my business my certificate my dress my family everything is mine mine and this man did not know any other language and i will say to my soul soul thou hast much goods laid up for many years take thine ease drink eat drink 
and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, thou fool. Who is a fool? Somebody who is amassing something that the fire of hell will burn off and melt away. Who is a fool? Somebody who is spending all his life to gather something together that he cannot keep. Who is a fool? Somebody who forgets eternity and is living only for time. Who is a fool? Somebody who forgets God in his pursuit of gold, of riches. Who is a fool? Somebody who is not thinking that his life is in the hands of the Almighty God. All he can think about is, I've got this, I've got this, I'm going to get more. I pray you'll not be a fool. Look at verse 20. And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? You know, when somebody dies, they sometimes will ask a question. If they knew that was a rich man, they will say, how much did he leave behind? And somebody will shout from the back, he left it all behind, all behind. Everything they run after, they're going to leave it all behind. The only thing you'll take with you, you'll not take the clothes with you. You'll not even take your body with you. You'll not take certificates with you. You will not take anything with you but your soul. If that soul is not saved, if that soul is not giving to the Lord, if that soul is not serving the Lord, and you die just like that, you take a miserable, wretched, empty, worthless soul to the other side. I pray that will not happen to you. Because we're going to leave everything behind. But the thing you cannot leave behind, your salvation. The thing you cannot leave behind, the grace of God. The thing you cannot leave behind, the righteousness that he gives you. The thing you cannot leave behind, the labor, the work you have done. Because it says that they do who die in Christ, their labors follow after them. I pray good works will follow you in Jesus' name. Look at this now in verse 21. So shall it be that so is he that lays up treasure for himself. And it's not rich towards God. How does God count riches? He counts riches in souls that are one. He counts riches in many that you turn unto righteousness. And if you are not winning any soul, you are not laboring for the Lord, you are not serving the Lord, you don't have any riches that God can count. And I pray that you will not be like that in Jesus' name. What a loss this man had. What kind of loss is that? An irreparable loss. It's lost everything. What kind of loss? An irreversible loss. It's lost everything. Now there's no way to come back now and make a change. What, a kind, what kind of loss? An irreplaceable loss. That is lost it all. And then God says, you're a fool. You've lost it all. Where will your soul be now? Where are you going to spend eternity? That's what Jesus said. Look at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. I'm reading here from verse 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Hey, you say, praise the Lord, I'm saved. My soul will not be lost. Okay, read it this way. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and he loses that soul? A soul that the Lord has given you. Keep this man. 
preach the word to him and bring him into the kingdom and keep him in the kingdom what shall it profit you if you gain the whole world and you lose that soul and there are people that lose just not just one soul a hundred souls you have a local church and you are in charge of that local church a hundred hundred souls the people you could help to be firm in the lord and to be committed to the lord and then you are not there you know the meeting has started already you're still in the market and you're still in the shop you're still buying and selling and then you say the other people are there are they the people that are in charge? Or are you the one in charge? And then eventually, as the meeting is coming to almost an end, then you, you know, you come in and say, where are you now? What have you done? What have you done? Okay, now, and then when everything is finishing, you then come to the appropriate and say, praise the Lord. Wonderful. I knew you'll be there. Wonderful you are there. Don't mind that, you know, I couldn't come early today. Tell us why you couldn't come early. What an example is that that was showing to other people i couldn't come early today what shall it profit you if you gained the whole world and you lost all these hundred souls and there are some of us who have charge of a thousand souls a thousand and five a thousand and, and seven hundred souls what shall it profit a man you don't have time to prepare you don't have time to pray. You don't have time to give the bread of life to these 1,700 souls. What shall he profit a man? If he gained the whole world and he lost all these souls, the Lord is telling us to wake up so that you don't commercialize your life. Your life is more than naira and dollar and pounds. Your life is so precious that Christ had to die for you. Make use of this life for the glory of God. Make use of this life for eternity. And think of the regret that will come at last to a man like this. What kind of regret? Number one is the regret of a wasted life. I wasted my life. I wasted my life. I had an opportunity five years ago. They asked for workers. They wanted pastors. I could have volunteered myself. But now I was running after money. I wasn't available. The regret of a wasted life. They, they said that they needed somebody to walk this area, this area, and this area. And I knew I was qualified spiritually. I could do it. I was on fire for the Lord. But I just got married. And my wife said, honey, are you going to go to that workers meeting again? I want to see your face. I want to be with you every time. And are we going to live like this? And then I yielded to my wife. And I couldn't go to that. I couldn't face that challenge and take up that work. And after five years, so you look back what I could have done, where I could have been, and the, the, the profit I could have made in the kingdom of God, the regret of a wasted life. I pray today things will turn around. And the things that are taking our attention, all those things, we're going to turn them around in Jesus' name. The, re the remorse of a weary life. The remorse of a weary life. You know, we toil so much in the world. We wake up so early in the morning. And then we're there toiling for them. If anything happened to us, good luck to you. The world is not going to take care. If they don't find you in the shop again, they'll go and buy that thing in another place. And then at last, you've wearied your life. And you spoiled your life. You ruined your life. And you spent the better part of your life on the things of the world. And then you're saying, what a waste. And what weariness I now suffer, the remorse of a weary life. And then the ruin of a worldly life. You're running with the Joseph's. And you know, they've got this, I want to get it. They are there, I want to be there. They have amassed that, I want to amass that. And then at last, you're you become worldly. You become a friend of the world. And you're competing with the people of the world. And you ruin your life. Today, the Lord will bring us back. It's like... The opportunity is here today. Now, look at Moses there. The first 40 years of his life, gone. Look at Moses. The second beat, 40 years, gone. And after 80 years, you'll think the man now should be saying bye-bye to the world. I'm going to the other side. And God called him and said, you know, Moses, I have a job for you. My life is spent already. A lot is gone under the bridge already. How can you call me at this time? I can still use this life at 80. 
And you at 50, you can still use your life. At 70, you can still use your life. As old as you are now, if you give this life to God, all the wasted years and the lost years, we can recover everything. A new life will come to you. A new spirit will come to you. A new power will come to you. A new excitement to live. And you will say, praise the Lord. It's like I'm a newborn baby. I'm excited. I want to live now. I pass that spirit of the conqueror to you in Jesus' name. Point number three is the concentration and the compensation. The concentration and the, con and the compensation of a rewardable life. Your life will be rewardable. Am I talking to somebody there today? I said your life will be rewardable. How will your life be rewardable? The consecration. The consecration that you need. Let me show you. Exodus chapter 21 exodus chapter 21 and i'm reading from verses 5 and 6 it says if the servant shall plainly say i love my master my wife and my children i will not go free then the master shall bring him unto the judges he shall also he shall also bring him to the door and also unto the doorpost and the master shall bore his ear through with an awl and uh, he shall he shall serve him forever this is a consecrated man what happened here is he was bought like a slave to, by the master and then at the year of jubilee the year of release the master says this is a year of release it's a year of liberty you can go free and then the servant says i don't want to go free i love my master i love the wife you gave me and i love the children that wife has born for me therefore i voluntarily make myself a perpetual servant to my master for the rest of my life what does that mean for you jesus is our master right and then you say i love my master i love his salvation that he gave me and i love his service the commission that he has given me i will not go out free even if our leaders would say brother we know what you are going through sister we know what you are going through will release you nobody can see you in this condition and still expect you to be serving and serving will find another person to replace you you'll say i love my master i love his commission i love his service i will not go out for you can bring other people they will do their part but nobody will take my place somebody there nobody will take my place this what the Lord has called me to, I will do it. I said I will do it. Another person may be available. Let him come. He will do his part. But I must do my part. That's a consecration. Even when we say you are released. Even when we say, don't worry. We'll find other people. we we'll want to replace you. You say, no, I'm still there. Until my last breath, I love my master. I love his commission. I love his service. I will not go out free. Uh, let's look at Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. The consecration of a rewardable life. Exodus chapter 32. And I'm reading here from verse 10. Now therefore, let me alone. Here is God talking to Moses. That my wrath may wax hot against them. And that I may consume them. Listen to this. And I will make of thee a great nation. Think about that. God said, I'm going to wipe out all the children of Israel because of what they have done, because of their idolatry. And I will make you Moses, the faithful one. Moses, the dependable one. I will make you a great nation. I make of you a great nation. Look at verse 11. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, 
Why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? He was pleading with, with God that God will not make of him a great nation. He would rather restore the children of Israel. That is giving up the greatest possibilities in your life. Giving up the greatest position in your life. Giving up the greatest possession in your life. So that the people who are backsliding will be restored. You say, I don't want greatness at the expense of the children of Israel perishing. They still must get to the land of promise. Uh, look at this. It even goes beyond that. Look at verse 32. Verse 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, he didn't finish that sentence. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Can you think about that? The man said, I'm not even going to get to heaven without them. You can blot me out of the book of life if you will not forgive these people and think of them to be your people. Isn't that consecration, Old Testament? And those of us now in the new covenant, what consecration do we have? Because it is a consecrated life that will become the rewardable life. Let's come to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. Here we're reading from verse 12. Ruth chapter 1. We're looking at verse 12. It tells us here in verse 12. Yes, now me talking to the daughters in Loton again. My daughters, go your way. For I am too old to have an husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I should have an husband also tonight. And should also bear sons. Would he tarry for them till they were grown? Would he stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again and upper kissed her mother-in-law but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, the sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. I want you to put uh, yourself here, my sister. You've lost your husband. That's bad news. You have not got another one to marry. That's bad news. And now the person should encourage you is saying, I see your condition. I sympathize with the condition. If you were my biological daughter, I wouldn't tell you to just stay like this. The woman was considerate. You can go back. Because even if I say I have hope, I know you love me. You like to marry somebody coming out of me. If I had the hope and I got married tonight, am I sure I'm going to have a son? Even if I had a son, will you wait? I understand. I understand that you love me. I don't have anything against you. You can go back. If you were, what will you do? Here is consecration. Here is what we're talking about. The life that will be useful in the hand of God. I'm looking at li that life this night. I said I'm looking at that life tonight. Your life will be useful. But look at it. Look at it. Look at how it becomes useful. In verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For, listen to this, Where thou goest, I will go. What does that mean? I've not been there before. I've been in Moab all my life. I've not gone that route before. It's going to be a new way. It's going to be an unknown path. But all the same, where thou goest, I will go. You know the people that are with us in this church, while everything is all right, while they get healed, while they get a job, while they have a wife, while they have husband, while they, when they have children, but let there be a problem. Let there be a challenge. All those people that have said, ah, forever, forever, this is my church. I will stay here. 
I will live here. I will die here. A little problem. Then we didn't see them on Sunday. We didn't see them for Bible study on Monday. And we said, that, Sister, come. You are not here on Sunday. You are not here on Monday. Why are you dra dragging your feet, Pastor? If you knew what happened to me, you will not talk like, talk like that. You'll be sympathizing with me. In fact, Pastor, if I tell you the story of my life as it is now, you will cry for me. That's why I'm not coming. And if God does not do something now, 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 this week, count me out. I'm not coming again. You see, that test came to prove that all those things we were saying before was fake, superficial. Ruth was not like that. I will not be like that. I said I will not be like that. I will stay in the house of God. You can count on me. Somebody there, I said you can count on me. You can count on me. I'll be there. Rain or sunshine, I will be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. Entreat me not to leave thee, not to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. I don't know, there may not be a conditioner there, I will lodge there. There may not be all the things I'm used to in my house over here, but I will be there. Do you know there are people that will not come to our church because of ordinary chair, the chair they sit on? Do you know there are people that will not come because, you know, when we were there, I'm telling you, in fact, I like finding myself all the time, it was so hot, I was sweating, I'm not sure whether I want to come again. Rose said, whatever heat, I'm going back there. Somebody there said, I'm going back there. I said, I'm going back there. Where there is life eternal. Where the word of God is flowing and reaching your soul. And where you pray like this and heaven opens to you. Whatever the physical condition, the spiritual life there, I'm going back there. I said, I'm going back there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. And then it says, and thy people shall be my people. Thy people shall be my people. I want you to understand, the Moabites, the despised, the Israelites. But Ruth said, I have made my choice. And your people will be my people. And the best of it all, thy God, my God. Thy God, my God. Look at this. Where thou diest, I will die. I'm sure you don't understand that. Look up here. Who was older, Naomi or Ruth? By all calculations normally, who, will, who should die first? Naomi. And Ruth said, where you die, after you have gone, even when you have gone, I will not leave. I will stay there until I die there. Think about that. Those who brought me into the gospel, those who brought me into this church and were coming together, going together, they were encouragement to me. Now they are going one by one because they are much older. And it says where they die, that same place where they die, even though they have died, I will still be there. I will die there too. That's the commitment you are talking about. That's the consecration that this woman had. And that's the consecration you are going to have. And the Lord will bless your life. And the Lord will reward your life. And then it goes on to say, and there will I be buried. Then he put a, she put a curse on herself. The Lord do so to me. And more also, if aught but death, part thee and me. I'm coming to the New Testament, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Acts of the Apostles. We're looking at chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 6. Acts, chapter 9. We're reading from verse 6. Acts 9, verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? He said, Lord, I give you, I give you a clean slate. Write anything there. What will you have me to do? 
Lord, I give you this sheet of paper. I sign my signature at the bottom. Now you can write whatever you want me to do. It may occupy my whole time. I sign for that. It may take all my energy. I sign for that. It may be unpopular with the people who have known me until this time. I sign for that. What will thou have me do to do? And then we're told in that verse 6, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. As we look at the life of Paul the Apostle, after this consecration, what do we learn? We learn of what God will have him do. Because he had said, whatever it is, I am ready. Pastoring, I'm available. He pastored. Evangelizing, I'm available. He evangelized. He also said, what you have, you have me do? Leading the youths like Timothy, leading young Timothys and young Titus, I'm available. That's what he said. He said, whatever it is, I'm going to do it. And then developing women through aged women that he gave instruction to he said yes i'm not going to count any part untouchable any part not dignifying enough i'm going to do everything and then he tells us he was nourishing and nurturing even the children for christ he said we nurture them like children like a nurse will nurture their children he said i'm available didn't he go into the ministry of writing and printing he said i'm available available for that to recording and spreading and sending forth the gospel messages to all places there's no electronics at that time he will write he will send everything to people and then they will take it to they'll take it to ephesus and Colossae and that's like took it everywhere he said that all the things we're doing now if God wanted him to be here and here and here and overload his life with total activity of the gospel with no, no space to breathe, he said, God, I am ready. Anybody ready there today? Anybody available there today? In the women's section, are you available? In the men's section, are you available? In pastoring, are you available? In evangelizing, are you available? Will the children church work there? Are you available? Will the youth and the students, are you available? This man said, Lord, I am available. What will you have me do? And that man's life was rewarded in a wonderful way. It has now come to my turn and your turn. And your life will be rewardable. My life will be rewardable. Remember once again, there's only one life to live. And it tells us only one life to live. It will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Things of this world, of this life, soon shall all pass away. But there is coming a judgment day. Others may, others may toil for riches or gain. But I would rather labor for his dear name. Only one life and it will soon be passed only what's done for christ will last i'll commit from today i'll commit my life to that thing that will last for eternity are you of that mind i said are you of that mind why don't you rise up and tell the lord oh lord i want to maximize the value of this single life the value of this single life i want to maximize it i will i will i will i will i lay this life on the altar i'm not going to live a cheap life a lazy life an idle life i'm not going to allow anything to hinder me or to stop me i'm going to serve the lord with all my strength with all my talents, with all my treasures, I lay everything on the altar for God to open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. Nothing will stop you. Nothing will stop you. Come back and lay this life on the altar again. And say, Lord, I am ready. Lord, I am available. Lord, I will serve you. I will serve you. I will serve you. Forgive me, Lord, of times of idleness, times of laziness, and times of drawing back, and times of withholding my covenant, my consecration from you. Now, I bring everything back to the altar.